This is Thule Talks, a program of information covering topics of interest to all Thule Air Base personnel. Welcome to this edition of Thule Talks. This time we're going to be focusing backwards on the 1983 year in review. I'm Air Force Sergeant Mike Wolverton, along with Colonel John P. DeGroote. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you, Mike. It's been an interesting year and a productive one. And uh, it was a long one, I guess, but uh, for you up here in Thule, but it's come to a close. You will soon be leaving. What do you think about the previous year? Well, I think uh, one of the great things about our ability here to uh, capture things on videotape is that it gives us a chance to kind of look back and reflect on what has happened. It's pretty hard in a few words to summarize a, a tour anywhere, let alone at Thule. Uh, hopefully during this program, we'll look at some uh, specific events that have taken place. It just coincides that my tour here as a commander uh, pretty well follows the calendar year 1983. And so as we look back on some of these segments of 83, I'd like to try to share some of my perspectives and conclusions about those events. But I don't think really at, uh, at this point it's possible to give a, uh, an overall conclusion of the tour. Uh, it has been a fascinating tour. It has been a challenging tour. It has been something that has uh, goes without any other similarity in any other part of my career. And I think these are the same words that my predecessors have used before me, and for very good reasons. Uh, but let's, uh, let's look at some of the specific things that have taken place and, uh, and just see what's been happening here at Thule in 1983. Okay. The first would be your change command ceremony in uh, January 18th of 83. That's right. Uh, the previous commander was Colonel Gary Hicks, and I came on station on the 17th of January, and on the morning of the 18th, we had our change of command ceremony in the rec center. And we passed the flag between us, and with that, the responsibility for command. Uh, it was at that time that I had the uh, pleasure of starting the work with the 10-12th Air Base Group staff, except back at that time, we were still known as the 12th Missile Warning Group. Right. Well, let's take a look at it then. The ceremony began with Captain Susan Ross reading the call to orders. Attention to orders. Special Series Order G-02. Colonel John P. DeGroot, Jr. is hereby appointed Commander, 12th Missile Warning Group, Thule Air Base, Greenland, Vice Colonel Gary L. Hicks, effective this date. Sir, I relinquish command. The change of command was symbolized by the 12th Missile Warning Group flag being passed from Colonel Hicks to our new commander, Colonel DeGroote. I understand after Colonel Hicks left, there was phase upon phase upon phase, and it all happened after you got here. That's right, Mike. They really saved up for me. The uh, previous commander told me that they had one minor storm back in the September or October time frame, but they had had a very peaceful November and December and early January. And it seemed like he was no further out of sight uh, with the departing 141 that we were getting phased alert. Uh, and uh, we had a whole series of phase storms and it was getting to be a regular occurrence on Friday afternoon, we could count on what was gonna happen for the rest of the week. But those, uh, those passed successfully, thankfully, and the next big event on the agenda, as it is every year, is looking at that sky that gets progressively lighter by 20 minutes a day and looking forward to that great point when that sun comes back over the horizon. And I'm happy that last year we captured that in fine style with this film footage.
next significant event would be the arrival of a significant visitor to Tule. That's right, Mike. With the return of the sun comes the return of the visitors. And our first distinguished visitor of the spring uh, was General Jorgensen. General Jorgensen is the four-star chief of Danish defense. And it was a great pleasure to welcome him back uh, for, uh, so many, for another one of so many visits he has had here before. Uh, we were particularly privileged by the fact that he, his wife joined him during this visit. For the new commander, it was a great delight because as I showed him around, he was so familiar with the area, I had no fear of getting lost. And it made a very comfortable tour. The general uh, attended a briefing that we arranged in conjunction with our Air Division commander, who was General Constantine. The 12th Missile Warning Group, as we were still known, was a component of Strategic Air Command aligned under the 40th Air Division at Wurtsmouth. The commander of the 40th Air Division, General William Constantine, was flying the looking glass at the same time that we were giving the briefing to General Jorgensen in our briefing room here at Thule. At a point in the briefing where we described our command relationships to SAC, we went to a live communication between General Constantine on the looking glass flying overhead in Nebraska for direct conversation with General Jorgensen here in our briefing room. Wonders and it's a delight modern. to review again the film footage that captures that event. Wonders of modern communication. You bet. Good morning, uh, General Constantine. Nice to hear you again instead of Copenhagen. Well, it's very nice to, uh, to hear your voice again, General Jorgensen, and I want to extend uh, a very warm 40th Air Division welcome to you here in the Danish capital. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to visit uh, Tuli. How have you been? Oh, fine. We are on top of the world, and the service rendered here on top as well. Well, very good. Well, it's, uh, sir, I know that you're very busy, and you've got a very tight Okay, uh, General, thank you so much. It was a very interesting briefing, and I can assure you, although we know modern technology, uh, we are here around the table a bit impressed, I can assure you. We certainly also appreciate the job you do, 
uh, in the cause of freedom and uh, preserving the peace. The next significant event of 1983 was when Thule Air Base joined Space Command. That's right, Mike. The formation of Space Command took place the previous fall, and in the spring of 83, the 12th Missile Warning Group, as well as other units that had previously been SAC units, uh, joined the Air Force's newest Major Air Command. We celebrated that occasion here at Thule with a formal dining out. We uh, used the format very similar to a New Year's Eve celebration so that at the official stroke of midnight uh, we would change over from Strategic Air Command uh, and put up the banners of the uh, Space Command. Mm -hmm. It gave us another opportunity uh, to look back at what this unit has done over the years as part of SAC and it was a great pleasure to be able to present during that ceremony certificates of appreciation from Strategic Air Command uh, to a number of the fine people that have uh, served the mission, whether it was a SAC mission or an Air Defense Command mission before that, uh, right on through to today's date uh, as this mission continues. The uh, videotape will also show the farewell message uh, that we received for that occasion by our outgoing 40th Air Division Commander, General Constantine. Mm -hmm. And at the conclusion of our ceremony and the changeover of the shields and banners, uh, we received a telephone communication via satellite uh, from our new commander, the commander of the 1st Space Wing, Brigadier General Ralph Spraker. So this is another piece of historic footage that helps us look back at 1983. 22 worldwide missile warning, space surveillance, and weather units came from Strategic Air Command to Space Command on May 1, 1983. The Space Command will also have full responsibility for two operational satellite systems, the Satellite Early Warning System and the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program. The first Space Wing will command, administer, train, and evaluate the assigned air bases and the field units. In celebration of the transfer of major commands on May 1st, there was a dining out at the Blue Nose Club on Saturday. The dining out ceremony encompasses tradition and good fellowship that enhances the military unit and can often make the difference between a good military unit and an outstanding one. The president of the dining out, Colonel John P. DeGroote, commander of the 12th Missile Warning Group, presented awards in recognition of the many contributions of people who have been supporting the mission of Thule in a cooperative effort. Some of the people receiving these awards included Commander Johansson, the Danish liaison officer at Thule for over three years, Danish police inspector Bent By, Mr. Rasmuslau, the Danish Arctic contractor site manager, the FSI site manager, Mr. Tom McKee, Mr. Sven Larsen, manager of the transportation department, Mr. Eric Bemgard, Superintendent of Flight Line Operations, and the Superintendent of Administration and Accounts for Danish Arctic Contractors, Mr. Bohr Christensen. The Air Force personnel that also received awards included Captain Donald E. Fry, Jr., Senior Master Sergeant Gaston Cannon, Jr., Master Sergeant Herbert E. Bright, Captain Rick Smith, Airman Ralph Posey, Staff Sergeant Dennis Eplin, and Master Sergeant Gary Carnell. In keeping with the jovial nature of the dining out, Mr. Vice President, Lieutenant Michael C. Venzulas, the Chief of Security Police, sent many unsuspecting people to the Grog Bowl. And as the evening drew to a close, we heard a special farewell message from Brigadier General William M. Constantine, the 40th Air Division Commander. Your performance of the important early warning and surveillance mission is a major reason why we are at peace today. We have good people up here helping to guard the northern frontier. You've proven that a harsh climate and tough duty can't stop dedicated people. You have a very difficult job and you do it very well. The past three and a half years have seen many important events and a lot of progress, including major upgrades of our facilities, surveillance equipment, and the Pea Mountain Relocation Project. I'm very proud of the way you've represented the 12th Missile Warning Group, the 40th Air Division, 8th Air Force, and the Strategic Air Command. You've helped maintain peace and security, and you've helped make Thule a better place to work and live. And on behalf of General Davis and General Campbell, 
I want to thank you for your excellent and loyal support. Best wishes for continued success under Space Command. Good luck and God bless you. And then at the stroke of midnight, Senior Master Sergeant Les Moss, the first sergeant, replaced the Strategic Air Command plaque with the new plaque of the Space Command. Here's another major event that took place in May. This is the uh, time of year when we have our annual Armed Forces Day in open house. It uh, was extremely successful in 83. It attracted uh, Greenlandic families from the entire Thule area. Uh, some of these families came as far away as uh, 200 miles to converge on the Thule area. The uh, occasion uh, not only celebrates Armed Forces Day, uh, but it also represents a family reunion uh, for many of the Greenlandics. Mm -hmm. Our event started on Saturday morning, and it included games uh, of mucklock hockey, uh, which you have to see to believe. <laughs> and, uh, plenty of games for the children. Uh, we had as many as 39 dog teams participate in the dog sledge races that are another, uh, that is another highlight of the, uh, of the activity. Did you go out on one? I certainly did. That's uh, one of the events that uh, I think every commander uh, looks forward to during his tour is the opportunity to participate in that event. I understand that was rather cold on those things, too. Particularly when you get out over the open ice. It, uh, you get a little breeze out there, and it's, uh, it gets rather nippy. It's a fantastic experience because for the Thule community, it gives us an opportunity to see firsthand the culture of the basic Greenlandic hunter and his traditions. Mm -hmm. The kind of dog sledge that you see out on the ice during this time is exactly the kind of dog sledge they have been using for centuries. Uh, to earn their livelihood in this part of the world. It's also a rare experience because you see that tradition in close proximity to the 20th century technology. And there is a great deal of wonder and awe in the eyes of many of the Greenlandics as they come into contact uh, with this part of civilization. I imagine there's a great deal of wonder and awe on the part of the Americans uh, looking at the Greenlandic tradition. I know I recently uh, had a chance to fly down through Sandy on uh, one of the SAS birds, which of course you can see outside, and looking at miles and miles of nothing but uh, ice, how the people can live there and survive. It's, it's amazing. There is another aspect uh, of this, and that is that Although the languages are so different uh, between the Greenlandic language that uh, has only been recently a written language and the Danish language that uh, the Greenlandics are uh, taught in the schools mm -hmm. in Greenland, uh, and of course both being different from English, is that all of those differences are, are overcome uh, when you make contact with the Greenlandic children. Mm -hmm. Their response to the games uh, need no translation. Um, they understand the games and they thoroughly enjoy the games and everyone, whether they are American or Danish or other Greenlandics, thoroughly enjoy their enjoyment. It's a universal language. This past Saturday was Armed Forces Day at the top of the world with the Americans, Danish and the Greenlandic people joining in a full day of activities out on the ice. Starting off the action, there was a muckluck hockey game between the security police and Barracks 205 in the first quarter, Barracks 205 led three to nothing. They widened that gap with a five to one second quarter score, finally topping the security police nine to three. The second Mukluk hockey game pitted a team representing the Danish Arctic contractors against a team made up of Americans and Greenlandics. The Danish Arctic contractors won that one four to two. And in the final Mukluk hockey game of the day, the Danish team won over the Barracks 205 team five to zero. You have to learn to pace yourself. Pressure. You're just like everybody else. Pressure. You've only had to run so far, so good. But you will come to a place where the only thing you feel are loaded guns in your face. And you'll have to deal with pressure. Oh. 
Trackmaster rides were going on throughout the day, but next up on the agenda were the games for the Greenlandic children, with prizes going to the winners. made ready for the dog sledge race. Dog sledge number 10 crossed the distance of four miles in 20 minutes, 40 seconds. Sledge number 12 came in second with a time of 22 minutes, 30 seconds. And in third place was sledge number 17 at 23 minutes, 40 seconds. We're here with our own Luther Frost, AFRTS member, who just completed one of those dog sled races you just saw. Luther, what was your impression of that race? Well, it was cold and windy, but it was the best fun I've had since I've been up here. I noticed that the dog sled itself didn't have much padding there. Uh, what, what was it like hitting those bumps out there? Well, a couple of them were pretty bumpy, but it was smooth most of the way. It was, I got some good pictures out there, too. What was the, the, some of them took off pretty quick. What do you think your maximum speed? What did you get up to? We could have been doing 15 miles an hour. Who knows? It was, I was just so thrilled. I was just like, wow. <laughs> and the Greenlandic, he just kind of mushed him all the way through, or what did he do? That was, that was nice seeing the way, you know, he mushed him along and got him going. It was a really <laughs> unique experience. I noticed they kind of bunched up around the first turn. What did they do, just kind of one follow the other, or what was it like out there? I, I, I think they have, like, one lead dog, and he takes the lead, and the others just kind of follow along him. And, of course, the Greenlandic gets them to turn. I don't know how, but he does. And the dog just keep on going, huh? Keep going, oh, yeah. 
Okay, I guess you want to warm up now, huh? Yeah, I want to go sit in the van and warm up. <laughs> okay, great. The first, second, and third place winners received Winchester rifles, while the rest of the Greenlandic sledge drivers got consolation prizes. Jacobina Christensen also received an award in appreciation for her help as an interpreter. Then it was off to Hangar 8 for some food and refreshments. The Morale, Welfare, and Recreation Department provided hot dogs, chicken, potato salad, and ice cream to the now weary participants in the Armed Forces Day festivities. The Danish band Happiness performed while everyone relaxed after their long day out on the ice. Outside the hangar, a Danish Gulf Stream was on display, along with a United States Air Force C-141. I think the fact that this has been captured on videotape is a tremendous uh, tribute to the camera crews that were out there braving the elements, not only standing there and getting this kind of footage, uh, but also lugging the batteries that uh, did not last very long in that kind of cold temperature and they had to be constantly changed and then warmed up in vehicles to make this documentary possible. From fires in building to uh, fires of a more ceremonial nature. That's right, Mike. The big event in the middle of June is St. Hans Eve, and that is celebrated uh, in Scandinavia by a humongous bonfire, and it was observed in fine style here at Thule. And we've captured that also with film footage, and I'm happy to report that uh, this went exactly the way the fire department wanted it to. <laughs> the bonfire burned to the ground. The activities going on behind me is not another readiness exercise for the base fire department, nor is another short timers party over at the club. This happens to be an old Scandinavian custom known as St. Hans Night. It's also known as Midsummer's Night. Danish and American residents of Thule gather together to celebrate the observance of this year's St. Hans Night, which also included a vessel representing the Thule Yacht Club. The guest speaker at this year's St. Hans Night was the Danish liaison officer, Commander Eric V. Johansson. I had an opportunity to speak with Commander Johansson about the history behind the St. Hans Night custom. At least the name uh, goes back to what you call St. John the Baptist. And uh, tomorrow, the 24th of June, is St. John the Baptist's Day. There we got the name from. But what we are celebrating here is more a heathen tradition, uh, which uh, started centuries ago back in Europe, especially in Scandinavia. And uh, it started up that uh, uh, we have to, they had to celebrate the midsummer. And by the way, the longest day was on the 21st of June or the 22nd of June, uh, depending on which year it is. And that's what the heathens were celebrating. But furthermore, there is another he heathen belief that uh, by doing that, you protect your harvest and you get rid of all the witches. Because on Midsummer Night, the 23rd of June, uh, the witches and the trolls and the elf maids is loose. And uh, uh, you, of course, you have to protect your harvest. You have to get rid of all, all those monsters. And you do that with your bonfire. Uh, in Denmark, uh, we have it all over the country on the 23rd. It's a little bit warmer than here. It's not snowing, at least. Uh, and uh, it's really a beautiful sight, a beautiful view. Uh, that's in short what it's all about. And has this uh, tradition here at Tilly, how long has this been going on? Oh, that has been going on for eight years now. Uh, rumors tells me that the background is that uh, no, for sure that the first bonfire was uh, was up here, established up here in 1975. And the rumor says that the reason for that was that in 74, we really got the first uh, 20 or some females up here. And then we needed to get the bonfire to get the witches off. But that is rumors. Reporting from the hottest spot in Thule at this time of year, I'm Sergeant Jim Monholland for Newswatch. Hey, did anybody bring the marshmallows? We 
had a number of bystanders. In fact, it was a rather chilly day, even though it was in the middle of June. Uh, but the heat of the fire, as it got burning pretty good, uh, was quite comfortable. But some of the people that uh, decided to be a little bit more distant from the gathering uh, watched the celebration from the rafts that were built for the regatta that took place the preceding week. And that, by the way, set a new record in uh, Thule history books uh, for the first Thule regatta uh, ever held. From the formation of the Thule Yacht Club. And the Thule Yacht Club was born. From the Danish celebration of St. Hans Night in June, we go to the American celebration of the 4th of July. And we celebrated that in fine style here at Thule. The 4th of July celebration includes a very famous international open golf tournament uh, conducted every year on that occasion, right up there on our own Mount Dundas. And of course, the trick is to get there in the first place. Did you uh, make the climb? I certainly did. And it was a 700-foot uh, uh, hike. And I must say that it's, uh, it was worth every step of the way. Um, they say, though, to do that twice is a lesson reserved for the slow learners. <laughs> This is the kickoff of a weekend that represents uh, many other activities as well. There is a fun run segment, uh, kind of a mini Olympics, and there are softball games, and it's a weekend observance that is just full of, uh, of great activities. Uh, we found that on our particular uh, day for the golf tournament that we actually climbed through the clouds, and by the time we were up on the top of Mount Dundas, as you looked out across the top of the plateau, you could not see the ground below you, but you were playing on the clouds. And it was a fantastic experience and one that uh, I can see why everybody had looked forward to up to that point. And I'm sure that will be a traditional highlight of the uh, Thule scene. You had lots of rough up there on top of Dundas, I imagine. Also. Yes, the greens were a little on the rough side that day. Your comments on the golf course? Yeah. Uh, who lost your uh, Well, without uh, knowing that this has to be censored, that uh, climb was uh, not what I expected. Neither was the golf course. The rocks are hell. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in the foursome you were playing with. Good competition, with. good competition. I was in the foursome you were playing with, and you cannot say something what? bad about the rocks. You I, I had excellent luck, excellent luck. And you pressed right there at the end. That was outstanding. Those two putts on 17 and 18. You mean those 35-foot putts that hit about four rocks? That's it. Great. I guess one of the... Other significant events uh, for a year here at Thule is the arrival of the Coast Guard icebreakers to, uh, to actually clear the path. You bet, Mike. The spring time is a, is a time of tremendous change, and there's probably nothing more dramatic uh, than the change that takes place out there in North Star Bay. That ice that uh, was some uh, six to nine meters thick uh, slowly broke up uh, within the harbor itself, but posed major obstacles to any kind of incoming shipping until the icebreaker was able to come in and, and, uh, and cut a path through this. Mm -hmm. So the arrival of the Coast Guard cutter, Northwind, uh, was a very significant event uh, for this installation this past year. Earlier years, the ice has been known to clear itself, mm -hmm. but with the severe winter that we had just uh, completed, uh, there was no way we were going to get our, our resupply effort underway without the North Star blazing the way. And it continued to stay with us throughout most of the shipping season to do exactly that. After the bay is cleared, then it's time for the launching of uh, the barge and the Air Force boat. That's right, Mike. It wouldn't surprise anybody to hear of airplanes being launched from an Air Force base, particularly here at Thule, where we have one of the largest runways that uh, exists in the world. Uh, and in fact, we have one of the largest air bases in the world. But uh, the ironic part about that is we have no airplanes assigned here, but we do have the Thule Navy. We have three boats assigned to Thule Air Base. And this was the launching operation that uh, took place once the water was clear and the preparations were underway to receive our freighters. These were the vessels that were essential to be able to conduct those resupply operations. The barge itself is a, not only a valuable utility vessel, uh, but it also does yeoman's duty in uh, positioning ships for uh, tying up at dockside 
as well as pushing the itinerant iceberg out of the way so it no longer is a hazard to navigation. This tells us that the spring has really come to Thule and summer cannot be very far behind with the launching of the Thule Navy. And since the Air Force boats uh, cleared the way for the ships to come in, the next significant event was the arrival of the Southern Cross and the Air Force version of Box Stop. That's right. This is the beginning of the port season when we had approximately 20 different arrivals and departures uh, from the Thule Pier. Uh, providing us the bulk resupply of items on freighters and the resupply of fuel from tankers, as well as visits from uh, the Danish Navy. Uh, they came into our waters and conducted some specific operations of interest uh, from reports that were uh, released earlier in that season. That was the Danish frigate Engulf, right? That was the Danish frigate Engulf. And uh, it completed a, uh, a very busy port season that uh, stayed active right from the port opening in early July right through to the closing of the port in September. Some of our excitement during the summer months was on land as well, Mike. We had a series of training exercises for our fire department uh, that used buildings that were scheduled for demolition for smoke training and firefighting exercises. We really had a realistic exercise on this particular occasion. Uh, when the exercise transitioned into a real-world uh, burning building situation. And the end result was we accomplished the demolition project a little bit ahead of schedule, uh, but it was very productive from all respects anyhow. I imagine it did not cause much disappointment to the people that worked up there, but in mid-September, Pea Mountain closed down. That's right, Mike. The uh, role that Pea Mountain had played to our mission here uh, changed over the years from its initial function as an air defense and warning installation, a control group, uh, to a very vital communications link between our BMU sensors up on J site to the users of that BMU's warning information back down in Cheyenne Mountain and NORAD. With the improvement in communication technology, we were able to uh, replace the troposcatter type of communication link that P Mountain provided us with and replace that with a direct hop up to satellites directly from the J site as we're now doing. In that process, the facilities up at P Mountain uh, were then deactivated and P Mountain will now join the uh, remaining facilities out at Camp Tudo um, as facilities that are no longer needed uh, for the Thule Air Defense Mission, uh, but facilities that are now scheduled for removal and demolition in our effort to return to nature the uh, area of the defense area uh, that is no longer needed to support the uh, military missions here. So in the years ahead, we will see the gradual dismantling of the large antennas and the structures uh, up on Pea Mountain as we will also see the removal of the remaining residue of materials that were left behind uh, when the Army no longer needed Camp Tudo. 1983 also saw some very distinguished visitors here at Thule. Among them, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staffs of the United States and Denmark. General Jorgensen, of course, had been a visitor with us back in February. And this time, on his return in August, he was able to be the host for General John Vesey, of course, our own chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So we would had the distinct privilege and uh, honor of hosting both of these chiefs of their respective defense communities. General Vesey and General Jorgens, uh, General Vesey and General Jorgensen agreed to give us this interview and to reflect upon their purpose of coming here and uh, some of the differences between their uh, military organizations. What brings you to Thule? Well, I've come for two reasons. One, I've uh, come to Greenland at the invitation of my fellow member of the NATO military committee, General Jorgensen. But uh, I've come to Thule because it's very important to the defense of the United States and the defense of the free world. It's Certainly, as everyone at Thule knows, it's a, a key installation in our missile warning system. And I've come here 
to see the business end of that system and to see the people who operate it. General, General Jorgensen, what brings you to Tule? You were here well, just a few months ago. Yeah, I was here in February. Mm -hmm. uh, that was actually my first invitation to to General University, but uh, unfortunately it couldn't be made that the time. So on a new invitation, uh, fortunately that was accepted, and uh, I picked up uh, a general at Keflavik, and uh, today we are going to visit Station North. So that's the main reason, but naturally I use every opportunity to go to Greenland, I like that island. <laughs> Uh, you do like it here? Oh, yes, I do. General Vassy, both the United States and Denmark belong to NATO. What do you see as the major problems facing NATO today? Well, I think uh, that NATO's problems are the same as NATO's problems have, have been through the years. It's a, an alliance of uh, free and sovereign nations uh, banding together to increase each other's uh, security by banding together. Uh, we don't have uh, vassal states in NATO as the Soviet Union has in the Warsaw Pact. We don't have one country that can give orders to the others. So the problem is keeping the political cohesion uh, among the, the political leaders of, of NATO. And I would say to you that uh, one reads a lot about NATO's problems, but certainly from our point of view, the military coordination, I believe, is, is better now than it has, has ever been. Another distinguished visitor we had at Tule in late 1983 was General Hardinger, who was the commander of SpaceCom and of NORAD. General Hardinger visited Tule on the return of part of his trip. He had visited the Space Command bases in Europe and came to our base and remained overnight. And it was again a distinct pleasure to welcome him to Thule. Uh, as the commander of Space Command, he is our four-star commander. And we had an opportunity to have an interview with him as well as a very pleasant uh, uh, afternoon of tours and an evening uh, uh, dinner with the general and his party. We had a total party visit of uh, some 26 individuals, and included in that party were six general officers. So we indeed did have a distinguished group of visitors on that occasion. The last significant event, as far as we're concerned here at Thule, would naturally be the Ulamond. That is certainly the highlight of the holiday season. Ulamon represents a tremendous example of the kind of community action that the Thule population put together. It's, of course, for the common cause of a uh, charitable collection effort. And the main benefactors of this charity has been traditionally the uh, Greenlandic children from the surrounding area. And to make this all possible, there is a madcap effort uh, on the part of many organizations, everything from uh, t-shirt sales to uh, baseball caps, uh, and probably the crowning uh, event of them all is the annual telethon for Operation Ulamon. Pies in the face. You look like you enjoyed that. It's not only uh, the Greenlandic children who are recipients of uh, the outcome of Ulibon, it, uh, it appears that uh, most of the base were recipients also. I think that is one of the greatest benefits of the operation, and it is that uh, catalyst that allows the base to pull together and to have a lot of fun and to do it all in the cause of uh, fellowship and positive contribution and we're hoping that in the years ahead that the potential that we see exhibited in this Operation Ulamon can serve even broader purposes. Uh, we know at Sonnestrom that the Operation Ulamon uh, provides benefits to organizations on a worldwide basis, uh, children's organizations uh, under the sponsorship of the United Nations and other very worthwhile causes. We're hoping that 
as a result of the success of this year's operation, which uh, set new records in participation and financial goals achieved, uh, that we too will expand our horizons and bring some of those benefits to bear uh, to other worthy causes around the world. Absolutely. It is certainly something that's within our capability and something that we as a community will only profit by in terms of the spirit and the contributions it will make uh, to the community attitude of Thule. The recipients uh, or the Thule population were not only recipients of uh, many pies that were thrown and uh, being put in jail, but uh, I think it was quite a spirit of uh, togetherness, as you say, that uh, was a main bonus that the people at Thule here got was the well, it was spirit. It was not without its uh, more tense moments, uh, Mike. Uh, you may have noticed from our viewing of earlier film footage uh, uh, that one of the changes that took place during this was the result of a hair-raising experience that, uh, that I had during this celebration, as well as other participants. I don't know if it was a hair raising experience or a hair lifting experience it, it was more both apropos. it was absolutely both <laughs> it's all right Trent. have at it wait a second get licking okay all right i, I, I just don't want you to slide up i think Trent's still thinking about that assignment to grand Forks. <laughs> give me a head with hair long beautiful hair shining gleaming streaming flax and waxing give me down to there shoulder length mentioned the major monetary outcome of Project Ulemond is uh, the Greenlandics. We have this shot here of the uh, Greenlandic kids receiving uh, some of the benefits of the Ulemond. Again, with the benefit of videotape, we were able to go up to the settlement at Kronak and capture the presentation of the gifts to the Greenlandic children. And here again, we see the example of the universal language of the child as it uh, responds to the celebration of Christmas and the celebration of the receipt of the gifts provided by Operation Ulamon. It took a little bit of encouragement, but we were also able to invite a few of the children to appear before our cameras and to show us some of the things that they received. So all in all, I think it was a very 
productive and uh, hopefully fun-filled 1983 for you and the base here. This review of 83 brought back uh, so many memories and uh, so many great uh, uh, feelings uh, that one experiences up here. I think one of the most important uh, feelings that uh, you have by being part of the Thule community is the conviction that the mission that we perform here is one of the highest priority missions in the world and that the people that come here to perform that mission are some of the finest people in the world. And that we see in our Thule community that unique combination of talent, uh, that great teamwork that takes place between military and civilian, uh, between Danish and American, and that puts this package together and allows us to perform and in an outstanding way, one of the most vital missions uh, that we have within the free world today. It's a tremendous privilege and a tremendous pr a pleasure to be a part of that partnership for peace and that long-standing tradition between Denmark and the United States in providing for the defensive systems that we have here at Thule. The people that make up this team uh, are superb in their own right and it will be a great deal of uh, pleasant uh, memories uh, that I will leave here with and hopefully uh, thoughts that will someday make it possible to come back and uh, to see the great things that lie ahead. Our mission is as important today as it's ever been and probably more important than it's ever been. Uh, and the kinds of developments that we see going around us uh, right now uh, speak to the importance of that mission in the future. We will see in the uh, upcoming spring the development of the uh, radar upgrade to the BMU system. We've already seen the great improvements in uh, the efficiency of our communication systems. And we've seen tremendous strides uh, in upgrading our computers. These are the things that tell us that, uh, that Thule is important. When we have our visitors of the caliber of General Vesey and General Jorgensen, and General Hardinger uh, come to this base known as Thule. Uh, we know that these are important missions and that uh, we have their interest and most importantly, we have their support. And for all of us that have the privilege of being able to come and be a part of that, however short a period of time it is, uh, it gives us something I think we can look back on at any time in our future careers and saying it was a great privilege and pleasure to have been here. Those are the kinds of thoughts that this recap of 83 bring back to my mind. And I think uh, all of the military members and all of the civilian members, as they reflect on their tour of Thule, uh, can draw similar conclusions. Uh, hopefully it, uh, it has made a major contribution uh, to the uh, objectives that we all share, and that is the furtherance of world peace and the furtherance of human rights. And if that has been the case, it has been time well spent. Thank you very much, sir. We've been talking with Colonel John P. DeGroote, Jr., commander of the 1012th Air Base Group here at Thule. I'm Air Force Sergeant Mike Wolverton reporting. You've been watching Thule Talks. Thule Talks is a production of Armed Forces Television, Thule. Thank <laughs> you.